education. And this is this idea that learning actually involves a lot of play and um, fun. And this is not something that we know very much in college campuses anymore. So this talk is actually playing to learn. So this is actually playing to learn now. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. So I, I thought I'd start with this quote. How do I get somebody to learn something that is long and difficult and takes a lot of commitment and get them to learn it well? Does that sound like anything we, we teach? Something that's long, difficult. Uh, that's actually a, a question that um, game designers ask themselves when they go to create video games. They have to create these incredibly complex structures, and every level gets slightly harder. There's a lot of commands, there's a lot of complexity. Um, nobody can jump into level 30 and just get it. So you have to work your way up. And so this is, this is the same, um, same Herculean task that game designers face. So I had these three, four revelations. Uh, I've spent the last year or two thinking about um, games and play and learning and, and how we could capitalize on that and teaching math. I had a, a series of revelations. The first revelation happened when Wolf Math came out in May of last year. And now, let's have a, a show of hands. How many of you have heard of Wolf from Alpha? Raise your hand. Excellent. Much better numbers than other states. Okay. How many of you have actually gone to the website and used Wolfram Alpha? Raise your hands. Good. And how many of you have used Wolfram Alpha with your students? Yeah. So that's what we call a cap gap. That's a knowledge attitude practice gap. So it's like you know about something, um, you maybe even have a favorable attitude about it, but you don't actually use it. Maybe you don't have a favorable attitude about it yet, so maybe we're not quite to the cap gap yet. But, um, I think. So when this came out last year, I realized that the technology that we have to do math is now incredible. You can just type in what you want without any special syntax and get all sorts of results back. And so in the same way that we've done away with older math technologies like algorithms we use to find square roots by hand and, and uh, tables and logarithms and tables of statistics, uh, we have newer technologies that replace that. And something like this comes out, I start to think, Okay, well, what newer technologies, what, what are we going to phase out in favor of these newer technologies? So I started thinking a lot about this technology thing. You know, how does math shift because we have these new technologies? It doesn't shift instantly, but how does it shift? Um, the second realization I had is that we've been trying all sorts of strategies to improve our success rates in math. Um, we have, across the country, you know, about a 50-60% success rate in the algebra level classes. And it doesn't seem to matter what we try. We maybe have a pocket here or there where one teacher with one method is successful. But I think that a lot of that can become chopped up to personality and, and um, good coaching skills and things like that. But we don't have any like magic bullet that, that fixes anything. We've tried all sorts of stuff. And a lot of it hasn't even been really well researched. It's just like, well, this looks good. Let's try it. Right? So as long as we're doing that, as long as we're saying, well, this looks good. Let's try it. Well, let's try something you know, radically different. So we've tried everything else. Okay. Um, so the, the third realization I had was that my students, they play all these video games outside of class. I don't know if you've noticed this. I've noticed this. Um, they play all these different video games outside of class. And these video games require them to memorize the layouts of levels, and how to use you know, about 15 different functions on the, um, on the consoles and on the, um, on the controllers. And you know, to work in teams and to apply complex logic skills in various places. Oh, I need to do this, 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 and then this. I think, well, heck, my students don't seem to be able to learn algebra, but they can do all this other really complex stuff that requires. Oops, I skipped, didn't I? Um, that requires all of this memorization and logic and strategy. Okay, and that memorization and logic and strategy. And learning procedures, that's all algebra too. So why is it so hard to learn algebra and so easy for them to learn these games? So the last realization I had was when I went back to visit my dad in Wyoming, and my dad still has the first computer I ever had, which was a TI-99 4A. Anyone else have one of those? Hooked up to your TV, you know, it's lovely. And he still has all the cartridges. <laughs> This is, for example, a game called Munch Man, which is like a knockoff from Pac-Man, right? And I sat down at this computer, and after not having touched this program for 15, 20, 25 years, I don't know how long it was, I'm not going to count, I don't want to do math, it's getting depressing. Um, I could play up to the same level 
I could play up to when I was a kid. <laughs> You're like, I remember where all the ghosts were, I remember what patterns to follow on the screen, I remember when to back up, when to go forward. I would look at it and just see the visual and know, oh, this was the really hard one, but I'd still be able to play it. I thought, that's incredible that I can still play these games that I learned so long ago. How cool would it be if my algebra students could still do the algebra I taught them 15 or 20 years later? Wouldn't that be cool? It would be cool if they could do it like a year later. <laughs> Forget the 15 years, I, I go for a year, you know? And so this, this is another game that was on this one. It's called Tombstone City. And this one, not only could I still play it,
between children and adults is that children still think that learning is fun. And adults, if you ask college students, you know, like, hey, what's it like to go to college? You rarely will hear, oh, it's really fun. You know, their life outside of college is fun, their life in college is, well, it's work. Our brain is ready to learn. We, we want to learn by patterning. We want to fill in blanks for what we don't know. We're always looking to, you know, make, make, sometimes you have conversations with people and they guess the next word they're going to say, you know. We're always looking to fill in blanks in the world around us. So I'm hoping that maybe we can take advantage of this in adults, okay. This may require us to stretch a little. It would be hard for us to think about how we turn math into play. Because that's not the way we learned it, and that's not the way we've been teaching it. And so on us, this is, this is, this is the hardest transformation. So I want to walk you through an example of um, called Think Like Babylonian. Some of you, we played this yesterday. So you guys who played this yesterday, zip it. You're not allowed to cheat. Okay? So I played this game with my classes, and there's, there's kind of two ways you can teach the Babylonian number system. One way is you can tell the class about the Babylonian number system. And the other way, is to turn it into a game. That's what Babylonian looks like, by the way. It's all done with um, wedges and clay tablets. And um, when I do this live with my class, I have them tell me a number, and then I plug it into Wolfram Alpha and get them the graphic so that they can see it. And we do this until they can tell me how the number system works. Okay? So we're going to do a mini version of this, so it doesn't take too long. So those of you who don't know how the Babylonian number system works, I want you to take out you know, something where you can make a note or two to yourself. And I'm going to show you a series of numbers. Now, of course, this takes a little bit longer than doing in the class because they throw out random numbers and we look at what those numbers are. And sometimes they kind of guess well, and sometimes they just throw out numbers all over the board. It takes them a while to settle on something that starts to give them good information. Okay, I'm going to do that settling process for you. Okay? So here's what two looks like. Okay, two martini glasses.
but you want them to have the fun. And so you have to change up the way you do it. Okay, so that's an example of taking something that I normally teach and shifting it. Okay, I call these, by the way, um, this, this type of teaching where we just tell them everything up front and then we do problems. I call this basically giving away the cheat codes. We're telling them how to, to, to do the game without letting them ever play the game. So, um, well, was them. Okay, sorry. <laughs> we like something if we can start to see patterns in it. You know, we probably like math because we were able to see the patterns really well. And you know that feeling you get when you get a problem right and it was a hard problem, you go, yeah, you know, that's awesome. You know, so when that happens, when we begin to see the patterns, we start to groove in it. It's why also students, when they study, they tend to study the problems they can already do well. Because it's no fun to study the problems they can't do. It's only fun to do the problems you can do. So they sit down and they study, and they might say, I studied for two hours. They probably did, but they only did the problems they could already do. Because that's the only part that was fun. Think about that next time somebody tells you they studied for five hours. So um, I think in education that we've, we've taken the fun out of learning. We've, we've turned it all into an I tell you, and then you practice it. And what I'm afraid of is that if we're not careful, we're going to end up taking ourselves out of learning, too. Because if all we're doing is telling the students how the world works, then other technologies could tell the students how the world works. And other technologies could work with the students on their homework problems and give them feedback on those things. And so we have to get ourselves back in that picture. So we're going to talk about how to do that. Okay. So there are some problems, though, about this whole like learning as play thing. The first problem is that learning isn't linear. When you're in a room of 30 students, you kind of feel like you have to walk them through in a linear path because you have to have some structure to how to do it. Um, so I want to show you this great example. Of, uh, I hope that some of you have seen this movie, Lord of the Rings. It's a great cartoon by XKCD. I'm going to zoom way in on it. And um, what they've done is map out the entire series of movies. Colors represent different species, so like men are one color, and the orcs are one color, and the wizards are one color. And when you die or come back to life, you see a little poof, see so again all of their poof. <sighs> back to life. And so this, this maps out the complexity. This was the, this was the map of how the movies ran. So you have to think, this is what students are used to in their entertainment and their regular life. They're used to plots with this kind of level of complexity. Now imagine if we had taken a movie like Lord of the Rings and we made it into a textbook. Okay, this is something how it would go. We would follow one character, Arlen. We would follow him until completion. Then we would go to the next character. We'd follow them to completion. And then we go to the next character. And we follow them to complete. We do it really thoroughly and really well and really linearly. <coughs> but when you compare that to what students are used to seeing, it just doesn't stack up. It's not intriguing enough to the brain. And so we're starting to have problems with our students. Maybe you noticed this. It's boredom thing. Okay. <laughs> so unfortunately, that's what Lord of the Rings looks like if, um, if, if we linearize it. So boredom is the brain casting about for new information. It's the feeling you get when there are no new patterns to absorb. So next time you, you look out at your class and they look kind of bored, because they all do that. My classes have these, these moments too, right? You look at the class and you think, they just don't care at all. Think about this. Are they getting, new inform are they getting stuff that they can form patterns with, or are you just telling them how it works? There's a big difference there. By the way, these are all quotes from Ralph Costa, that theory of fun book that we raffled off. Um, that's, it's a phenomenal book. I highly recommend reading it because for me, it was like a book about teaching. Everything he said about fun, to me, he was talking about learning. Okay. So fun for games arises out of mastery. It arises out of comprehension. It is the act of solving puzzles that makes games fun. In other words, with games, learning is the drug. There's no fun in leveling up if you don't learn anything new on the level up. Right? You have to, to play, keep playing a video game, you have to be given something new on each level. Some new puzzle or pattern or skill or something, or it's no fun. Okay, so unfortunately, we're kind of stuck in formal education. We spend a lot of time on this kind of surface level learning. Um, the brain actually functions at three levels. I'm going to kind of translate them to kind of common speak terms. The first level is um, conscious thought, which is kind of this level that our students like to function at, especially
especially in math, like facts. I'll just memorize facts and I'll get by. Okay, and so um, making lists, recalling facts, mathematics, uh, that's all conscious thought. The second level of thought is the sorting and packaging. I think we get here with some of our students and we don't get here with our students. This is that compare and contrast, that sorting of information. This is different than this. This is the same as this. And the third level is autopilot. This is when we run scripts of things, and we all do this well in math. We see an equation, and we run the script, solve equation. Our students who are just learning, they see an equation, and they try to run step after step after step after step separately, and they get mired down in the details, and they don't see it as a script. They see it as individual pieces of information. Okay, so what we need to do, I think, also, I would like to point out that's very similar to Bloom's taxonomy, for those of you who've seen Bloom's taxonomy. And just in case you have to show this to anybody later, I want to show you that there's a Pirates of the Caribbean version of Bloom's taxonomy. <laughs> I won't play it for you, but I promise if you go on YouTube, you can see it. It's much better than just Bloom's taxonomy. It's the boring of Bloom's taxonomy. So where do you think we want our students' brains to be? If we want them to remember algebra 15 years from now, where do we need to get them? We've got to get them to autopilot. We've got to get them to the point where they see the equation, they just run the script. It's natural to them. It's, there's no question about the 20 steps that might take me to do this problem. It's the one step it might take me to do the problem. Okay, so the second problem, as I see it, and I'm going to give you a little blast from the past here, is that um, we're giving away the cheat codes up front, like the Babylonian problem I showed you. And so, remember this music? My guess is that those of you who play this game are like, in your mind, you're like one step ahead of time. Okay, so let's do that for a second. Um, stop the music. So let's imagine that you sat down to play Super Mario Brothers, and you've never played it before, and somebody, right as you're about to start the game, somebody sits down next to you, and they tell you everything about that level. They tell you where the coins are, they tell you which pipes to go down, which where to jump to avoid things. And so every time you're about to do something on your own, they tell you what the next step is. How would you feel? Would that be any fun? No, and so you get to the next level and you think, okay, fine, I get to play this level myself, and they do the exact same thing again. They tell you everything up front. And you just have to follow their directions. Right? So that's what I mean by the cheat code problem. I think that um, learning is a delicate balance between boredom and frustration. Right? And the problem that we're doing, like if you think about how we teach exponent rules, say in an algebra class, what do we do? We might work out how the exponent rules work, but we still tell them the exponent rules right up front. Right? We give them the cheat codes and then we tell them to do problems. Right? It would be much better if we could find a way for them to develop the rules and then work with them because then they would be the ones doing the discovery and having fun and doing that discovery. Um, in our classrooms, the reason we're having so much problems right now is because we have a bunch of students who are bored, a bunch of students who are maybe right there, and a bunch of students who are frustrated. Right? The problem is if you teach the high ones, you lose the bottom two thirds. If you teach the middle, you piss off both ends. If you teach the bottom, you piss off the upper two thirds. It's not really a great place to be, is it? Okay, so the best instruction, this is, um, I think he's actually, I put cognitive scientist here, but I recently informed him he's actually a physicist too. Um, the best instruction, so this is not my quote, but I thought it was a great quote. The best instruction hovers at the boundary of the student's confidence. In a perfect world, if we were all tutoring one-on-one, -on -one, we would just feed students enough that they could learn the next piece on their own. So then there's a third problem, and that's that on these linear paths that we, we have, students get stuck somewhere, and when they get stuck, they cannot progress past that point, because the next step requires them to understand the previous step. And so this is basically what we do in math, because we have this problem, we're going to push 30 students, 40 students, 100 students through at once. We do something like this. We say, you can spend look very familiar to you if you've taught you know, beginning algebra or pre-algebra at some point recently. We teach addition and subtraction of integers, followed by multiplication and division of integers, followed by maybe absolute value in there somewhere, followed by some fun like terms, followed by solving some equations, followed by graphing inequality from number lines, and then eventually we get some 
lines, things like this. But there's absolutely no reason why, after learning addition and subtraction of integers, you couldn't do any of those things. Is there any reason why, if you know how to add and subtract integers, could you fit points on a line that's x plus y equals 5? Could you come up with combinations that work? Yeah. And could you solve one set of equations that have only addition or subtraction in them? Yeah. And um, could you learn multiplication and division of integers after that? Yeah. And if we were able to function off a model like this, then if you got stuck on absolute value, you could say, well, I'm stuck on absolute value, but I've got one, two, three, four, five other things I can explore right now, and I'll come back to it when I feel like more comfortable. Right? And we're not then trapping students at places where they can't get ahead. And you might think, yeah, well, how are we going to do that? See, this is what we can do theoretically in math. How are we going to do it? We have all this technology now. We've got all these online homework systems and, and uh, the, the incredible complexity of the internet. There's no reason why we couldn't develop technologies that allow us to do this to track students in different places at once, where they often meet up at some point for an assessment, but the path that they take is different. Okay, so what stops us? And um, whenever we talk about inquiry-based learning or discovery-based learning, there's always somebody in the room, and I'm hoping that somebody is here today, who says, okay, but there's a real problem with inquiry-based learning. What is it? Time. Yeah. Right, inquiry-based learning um, is this idea that we design and use activities where students learn new concepts by actively doing stuff. But you can't relearn, you know, hundreds, thousands of years of mathematics by inquiry. Nobody could do it, right? Um, that's basically what it would look like. Okay? And I don't think anybody would stand for that. But we don't have to relearn everything that way. We just need to find some key points where we can really capture interest, where we can do it well, and where we can use the technology to do it. Um, so, here's, here's one possible solution. And let me tell you that the game industry is really picking up on this. The game industry is trying to figure out what to take over next, by the way. Guess what they think they're going to take over next. Um, video games actually tend to do this very well. They encourage total mastery of one level before you move on. Right? Every player has their own experience. Everybody reaches the end goal. They do it on their own pace and their own time. Um, and who plays video games? This is even probably out of date right now. The last I saw... Um, under the age of 18, 99% of kids, male and female, play video games. Also, the standard demographic for video game players is a 40-year-old woman now. 40-year-old women play as many video games, because you've got to think about things like Farmville and Bejeweled, and they play as many video games as men. The demographic for video games is incredible. It's not what you think. It's not little kids. So, I want to show you some video games for math. Um, I'm really sure not going to um, So, I want to show you first that you cannot just go out to the internet and say, find me a game. Because the majority of games that are out there, I call lame games. Okay? So, you have to have a little bit of discretionary uh, capability here. So, I'm going to show you the first lame game. This game is called Math Baseball, which of course means it shows up on every math game page there is. Let's see how exciting this game is, shall we? See, I just got a triple. Ooh, a double. Wow, the graphics. The graphics are incredible, aren't they? But I promise if you go Google math baseball, this is what you'll get. Or math sports. Or math sports games. Alright, is this a game? No, this is like homework with pretty dressing. Not even pretty dressing, with horrible dressing. I mean, really, what's, what's really bad about this is that it doesn't even, this double, triple thing, it just randomly generates. It has nothing to do with the time or the accuracy or anything else, right? This is a bad game. Don't use these. Okay? This is more of a puzzle, but it is a good puzzle. This is one of the National Library of Virtual Manipulative Puzzles. Um, it doesn't involve a lot of interaction with the game, but you have to puzzle out how to put the numbers in the circle so that every circle adds to three. And they actually have a variety of these at various levels. There's one where everything has to add to zeros, one where everything has to add to one, one where everything has to add to 21, and, and different levels for each one. So you can actually find this and replay it as your class progresses. Um, but you have to do a lot of math to play.
play this game. But it's puzzle, I'm just saying. Okay? Um, because you have to keep rearranging things until you find an arrangement that works. Right? So you're engaged in doing, you know, by the time you solve this, you've probably done at least 25 or 30 addition problems of decimals. But it didn't feel like doing 20 or 30 addition problems of decimals. It felt fun. This is a game we played yesterday, for some of you who were here yesterday. It's a game called Mind Gem. And it's a, it's a clever little game. It's very simple. The idea is that you have to choose which of the four lines give you the most gems. Right? So you just, and it resets the screen, and you say, all right, which line that I'm given of these four choices gives me the most gems? And you choose it. And then there's actually sound here, right? It records sound. It goes ding, ding, ding. It makes you feel very happy. You can see the score increasing over here, and uh, and it levels. See, that was actually a very bad choice. Do you see that? <laughs> it never fails that if I recorded one of these, I make horrible choices. It's important to show what happens when you do it wrong too. Um, but it gets harder, and the equations start to get to where you have to rearrange them yourself to figure out, you know, how it works. And and the students um, actually quite enjoy it. It's, it's a nice little game. It teaches them some intuition about slope because they look at the four choices, and the fastest way to play is to have some intuition about well, those are upward slopes, and those are downward slopes, and those are steeper, and those are less steep. And so they start to develop some intuition that they don't get if I just hand them problems to do. Now you can actually have them turn these things in quite easily by having them take a screenshot after they reach a certain number of points and write their name on the screenshot. You know, so like you can say, I want you to play this 10,000 points, and then take a screenshot and turn it in. You can, if you have a, a class with computers, you can play it there. Um, John, who's in here somewhere, I think, had uh, his class just bring in their laptops, and they shared, partnered on the laptops that were brought in to play. This is one of my favorite little games. It's called Flower Power. I hope everybody's on this one. It's so much fun. Okay, so you can see it's got a nice little sound. So this game actually teaches fractions uh, an intuitive understanding for why you have to have common denominators and fractions. And so you start by learning um, with decimals. And so all we're doing here is reordering so the highest decimals are at the top and the lowest decimals are at the bottom. A good game will teach you how to play the game in the first level. So it's very easy. It's very easy to reorder decimals, right? But you think, oh, this is a piece of cake. The bee comes along, it pollinates the flowers, and then more flowers are going to grow. So now we've got more to do, okay? So now we've got some that are decimals. And you'll see that we'll have some that are fractions now. I'm just going to get there in a second. And you just keep moving flowers so that everything's in the proper order. So now there's one half, three halves. can't see very well. And so you just keep moving the flowers, and you can harvest the flowers at the bottom. So we're creating some complexity in this game now, more to think about. It turns out that at some point you're thinking so hard about all the other details of the game that you start to just be able to do fractions. You, you know, the fractions are going to get harder. You're going to have like denominators of fifths and tenths and sevenths and, and things like that. And you have to keep comparing them to the other fractions. Well, how do you compare two fractions? You've got to have a common denominator, right? And so they get really good, really fast, saying, okay, you know, three fourths, that's the same thing as six eighths. You know, because they've got to be able to put it into perspective with the rest. And so what you're doing is you're moving those skills into autopilot. They get so involved in playing the game that the skills become the autopilot. And um, it's a very fun game to play. So I'll show you. This is my um, math for elementary teachers class playing flower power in the lab. We meet in the lab once a week for an hour. And um, they were all playing, concentrating so hard. And it looks kind of like a girly game, but I promise all the guys will play it too. Um, and uh, they were all concentrating so hard. I was walking around the room with a camera taking pictures of them, and they had no idea I was doing it. Afterwards, I was like, did you guys know I was taking pictures of you? Nope. No idea. All right, so they were all, I mean, for 10 minutes, it was just silent except for the clicking noises in the room. And I asked them at the end, I was like, so, why do we need common denominators? And they very intuitively understood it in a way that they don't ever understand it if I just explain it to them. And I hope that that's one of those lessons that they'll then keep. So the, the next game I'm going to show you is a game called Factortress. It's uh, based off of Tetris. Right. And basically, you get a number like you have to make four, right now, so you have to either drag it to make a four by four, or a two by two, or a one by four, and then you drop them into the space. You can rearrange them just like a Tetris. So make them four by eight now. So as long as you create correct. 
directly, it'll put it in the space, and then you can rotate it using the up key. And of course, just like Tetris, you want to you know, have a whole row across the bottom to eliminate them. And what happens is, as you create these strange spaces, you need to know like three factor pairs to fit something into that space now. Right? So you might only know that four, 24 is 4 times 6, but now you better know that it's also 4 times 8, or you can't fill that space. Right? So it's teaching multiple factor pairs for any given number, because it's the only way to play the game. So again, you're learning, well, you're repracticing your multiplication tables, but it doesn't feel like you're repracticing those multiplication tables. It's much more fun, and it's highly, highly, highly addictive. <laughs> it's just a good thing, right? We want homework to be highly addictive. So the last game I'm going to show you, um, it's a video game, is called Waker, and this is a game um, that actually teaches about position and velocity curves for teach calculus. And so um, what happens is a little dude that's on the bottom here, as he, he has, how as he stops, you get a horizontal line there. So when he stops, the position the stops, and when he moves, the position moves. See that? And so then when, when you uh, press the button, it becomes a level you can go on. And so this has multiple levels, and every time you get to a new level, you have to figure out what basically makes he's basically a particle, right? You have to figure out how do I move this particle to get the graph that I need to climb to get out of here and to avoid the obstacles and things like that. Uh, and see that graph is too high, so I'm gonna have to go back and rebuild to a graph that's not so steep, right? So we're learning all sorts of stuff about um, position and as you as you level up, you begin to build the graphs using velocity as well. So the faster you move, the higher the graph is. The slower you move, the lower the graph is. It's very, very clever. Very clever. And fun. It takes about, I played it all the way through. It took me about an hour and a half to go through all the levels. But it was, it was very fun. OK, so I just thought I'd show you this. This is from our last night. <laughs> these are some you might recognize. These. these are instructors playing these games. That's three 
ones, and then you start to extrapolate that to the others. When you put it all together, you can come up with you know, a, a, an outline of what all of them should be. So she gave us just enough information to be able to solve it, so she turned it into a puzzle. Um, you have, I think, the sequence game, also the packets that are in your bags. Um, the sequence game just looks like this. It's a bunch of sequences. You just give them all the sequences and you say, you guys sort them out into mathematical categories. Figure out how they work, put them into categories, and then you tell me what the categories are. That's much different than me saying, here are arithmetic sequences, here are geometric sequences, you know, here are all the properties. Let them figure out how they go together. Then you can talk about it. So that's what it looks like on the desks when they start to sort through these things. And so um, we do all this, uh, it helps to have a document camera, it really does. But before we had, you know, even before I had a document camera, I had like a whiteboard. They would just come gather around and we would just do it in the space together. It's harder as the class sizes get bigger and bigger, but it's good justification for a document camera. And you could always make the pieces with um, overheads. Um, it'd just be a little harder to do, but there's no reason why you couldn't do it on an overhead projector as well, just to make them all see through pieces. Right, so um, we're going to show you these classrooms, so I'm not going to go through this. But the other thing we do to, to shift the learning is to shift the most of learning to the students. And these are the classrooms that we'll take you through if you want to see them. Um, we'll show you the old classrooms and the new classrooms. But I just want you to look at that. That's, that's see that? The students are like, getting out of their chairs to work on problems and, and to sort things. Those are students who are really engaged in doing something. I don't know what it is they're doing at the moment there. But they're really engaged in it. And when, you know, they take pictures of stuff they do on the boards so that they can uh, take it home with them, their notes. And that's the students playing one of those games. It's a logic puzzle game they're playing. And look at the computers. Look where the computers are. They're out. Where are they? They're off to the side, right? They are engaged in human-to-human -human interaction. They're having fun. They're, they're putting together logic puzzles. They're talking to each other. And this is, you know, exactly the kind of thing we want to see in classrooms. And that's the logic puzzle they're putting together. It's a picture logic puzzle. Each of them has part of the clues. They have to work together to solve the puzzle. It's a very complicated puzzle. It takes a while to solve it. I just want to show you the live. Again, they, you see, they, they don't realize that I'm taking a video of them. They all sign release forms, by the way. But they don't even notice me anymore. They're engaged in doing the work themselves. Thank <laughs> you.